I'm Marianne Fezenden, you're from AMTS and your English language host. We will be hosting five webinars this year with the focus on beef nutrition. Like our dairy focused The Nutritionist monthly webinar series, these multi-language talks target nutritionists, educators, veterinarians, and progressive producers. The topic will range from precision formulation, increasing efficiency, improving animal health, providing good stewardship, building better economics in tight markets, to guidelines for current formulation, feedings for superior, superior performance, and animal feeding behavior. The series is co-hosted by Paula Torillo from Cordoba, Argentina, translating for the Spanish-speaking audience. There will be a question and answer period immediately following the presentation. Listeners can submit questions through me or Paula. A complete recording of archived webinars, as well as the question and answer session for each, will be available later on for, on the AMTS website. For those of you who would listen to the presentations while driving, we have converted the videos to MP3 files that can be downloaded to your device for offline listening. This month, we are excited to host Dr. Alfredo Di Costanzo from University of Minnesota. Alfredo received his BS from ITESM Campus Quattaro, and I'm so sorry for murdering that, in Mexico. He attained his master's and his PhD from the University of Minnesota. At UMN, he has appointments in both teaching and research. His research focus is nutrition and management factors affecting the biologic and economic efficiency of cow-calf and feedlot operations. The evaluation of alternative feeds and feeding and management strategy to improve economic efficiency. And he also researches the determination of nutrient requirements to enhance economic and environmentally sustainable beef production. His talk today will be on backgrounding in beef cattle. I want to thank you, Alfredo, for joining us. We had a little bit of um, hairiness before you got on. Our electricity went out here in King Ferry, New York, and lost all sorts of stuff, but Paula covered for me. Um, for the audience, I want you to remember to type your questions in the Q&A window or the chat windows. We'll address them at the end of the webinars. Alfredo, I'm going to unmute you and forward the slide and turn the presentation over to you while I handle whatever mess I created in the interim. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, Marianne, I'm sorry. I appreciate the opportunity to visit with your audience uh, on backgrounding. Uh, it is a pleasure to work with you on getting this set up. And, and as you indicated, there was also hairiness on my end because I kept thinking it was central time, so. It's yeah, a, the time zones mess us up multiple times. You're not the only one. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, so I'm going to put this on full screen. I want to welcome your audience uh, and the locations they may be at and encourage them again to uh, 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 submit their questions as, as, as they see uh, necessary through the chat, uh, as you indicated before. Um, and today, folks, we're going to be talking about backgrounding uh, work that we've done in the past and uh, in companion with some of the work that others have contributed to the effort of backgrounding cattle in the feedlot environment. And so I consider this uh, concept of backgrounding the process of managing growth from weaning to harvest. So uh, today's discussion will focus on what are the forces behind backgrounding and how we're gonna be able to manage that from a perspective that will help producers uh, garner more, uh, well, enhance value of their crops as well as reach a level of profitability that is quite possible while we do this process. So. Um, Starting with first a basic de description of backgrounding, because I understand in certain locations this may not quite be uh, referred to in the same fashion as we do in the United States, and understanding that there are international listeners in the audience, 
I want to first define what I recognize as backgrounding, and there's some slight changes even within the United States. We'll describe those and then hopefully make some statements that will apply to other international environments. So basically, backgrounding is a process in which uh, we are managing a growth phase for calves that have been weaned from the cow herd before a high energy finishing or fattening phase is begun. Uh, at this point, the management of this phase will really depend on economic and environmental conditions. And then when I talk about environmental conditions, I am referring to forage and grain supply, the conditions that will dictate what level of energy utilization there would be included in the process. So as we see, using now my laser pointer here, uh, weaning is the process by which we obviously remove calves from the cows. The cattle in the United States can potentially go into a fattening phase, or they can be staged before this fattening phase to go into a pasture situation. In the United States, that is called a stockering phase. Uh, if instead of going from weaning to a pasture or weaning to a fattening phase, they could potentially go into a dry lot. And in that situation in the United States, we refer to as backgrounding. With an understanding of some of the systems in other countries, um, particularly this or this system, dry lot or pasture, are considered um, a pre fattening state in most scenarios. In places like Brazil, sometimes in Argentina, the fattening actually occurs back at a pasture situation. I don't have a commentary on that today, but I would welcome questions if the process that we're talking about for your particular phase is from a dry litter pasture situation to a fattening on grass situation. Today, our discussion will center on what happens once cattle have been staged through dry lot or pasture, moving into a fattening situation on a high grain diet. Um, so this picture is to remind myself to explain to you that the phases of backgrounding or stockering that take place in the United States, for us, it represents an opportunity to add value to all this beautiful resource out here, which is grass. And it permits us to put gains at a relatively inexpensive cost as we move cattle from uh, 400 to 600 pounds of weight, roughly about 180 kilos to 250 kilos, to about 300 to 350 kilos before we move them into a finishing phase. The alternative would be to move cattle into what I call a dry lot situation, so dry lot or feed lot, in the context of this discussion today will represent the same. Uh, in this particular example, you see 15 of our research pens at the University of Minnesota where we conduct backgrounding and finishing research regularly. As I look at the entire process of a pre-weaning, or rather post-weaning pre-harvest, uh, pre-finishing strategy, backgrounding is really an opportunity to stage cattle while enhancing value. The question to the audience or to the, the audience should ask themselves is whether this process will take care, uh, will occur in a pasture or in a dry lot or feedlot situations. Uh, we're not here to speak about the economics of that answer, but suffice it to say, that if we choose to go in a pasture situation, it's likely because we have access to the quantity and quality of pastures that will provide sufficient gains to retain compensation in a finishing phase so that we can capitalize on the value of staging cattle through a pasture situation. And the environment I work in dry lot backgrounding or a feed lot backgrounding is what occurs typically. In that scenario, the reason we do that is because we have the facilities to feed cattle. We have access to relatively inexpensive grain 
and we have also access to relatively inexpensive coal products, and that would be coal products both of the grain itself, such as distiller's grains, as well as crop residue that is harvested from the acreage that we utilize to harvest grain. So we, we happen to be in an area of the country where dry lot backgrounding takes place, mainly because we have access to all these resources. For those of you in the Southern United States that are listening today, pasture may be the option, and many of you are familiar with grazing wheat pastures in the Southern United States as a measure of staging cattle before they move into the feedlot. I consider backgrounding or the process of cattle being committed to a backgrounding scenario, a resilient com commodity. And the reason I say this is that we can stage the growth of these cattle at any rate of growth that seems appropriate given the economic and environmental conditions of the area that we're working in to be able to manage growth anywhere from a half a pound of rate of gain to 3.2 pounds rate of gain, which translates roughly to approximately um, a quarter kilogram to about 1.2 kilograms of rate of gain that would permit us to grow those cattle very slowly and that would be represented on the left to a lot faster, which would be represented on the right of this picture. So as an audience, you should think of uh, cattle that are being staged in a backgrounding situation under most production systems uh, as feeder cattle that are held on the hoof before finishing without really any loss of value. So if you think of apples or sugar cane or whatever may come to your mind, when it comes to an ag commodity out there, we always think that we have to move them through the marketplace in a, at a fast pace or else they would spoil or lose value in some other form. And then we may have to create uh, an alternative commodity, maybe juices or whatever. In the case of a feeder animal, we're able to extend the, the period of time during which they're growing before they enter a high grain finishing phase really dependent on the economic conditions, the environmental conditions, what is available to us at the local situation. So this has created a tremendous flexibility for the, for the operator of these uh, production systems. It has also created a variety of approaches that may result in different impacts when it comes to growing these cattle as they move forward into the finishing phase. And that is what we're going to be talking about today. So the very first concept that I wanna share with you is truly that managing growth before finishing tends to add weight. So if for whatever reason, we're holding cattle to be finished at greater weights, which will be reflected in greater hot carcass weights, we would see an increasing dressing percentage. For many of people listening, this may be considered yield. And this happens to be the ratio of hot carcass weight to live weight. So as we, as we promote final live weights that are heavier, it will result in final heavier carcass weights, which will also result and a greater proportion of the carcass being represented by the live in the live way. This is uh, data that came out of South Dakota State University in 2004, and it has served as a, as a principle of what is occurring in a background in situation. What I want you all to think about, in addition to what I've indicated, is along this uh, axis. Whatever we do to cattle in a pre-weaning and early post-weaning environment, we will be shifting this line to the, le to the left or to the right. So consider for a second uh, cattle that happen to be in a north scenario in the United States of the older traditional Angus or Hereford lines, which tend to be early maturing. By that we mean that their mature final weight will probably be somewhere in the range of 225 to 250 kilograms of hot carcass weight, which would represent approximately 400, 
50 to 550 kilograms of, of live weight. So in that scenario, as we plot this back to about uh, uh, the, the line of the regression, it would give us roughly about 60% dressing percentage. As we have moved from that type of genetics to genetics in which even the Angus breed in the United States has tremendous growth, we now are looking at carcasses that are processed or live animals that are processed at the point of 880, 900 pounds of carcass, which is equivalent to 400 pounds of, uh, I'm sorry, 400 kilograms in the metric system. And that would come back to about a 66% dressing percentage. So if you think of it in your own systems at home, whether you may be in Brazil or Argentina, what we're really doing is shifting the growth rate that ends up and moving this value to the left or to the right, and this line would obviously move accordingly. In other words, if I'm working with more traditional genetics, I may be in this range. If I'm working with international systems in which cattle and weights are at 450 kilograms, I'm working in this range of dressing percentage. If I'm working in Canada or the United States, I'm more in this range of final weights because of the genetics that we have, sometimes the same breed, then I'm working with dressing percentages in this scenario. This is really important as we move to what we retail at each of these countries. And in the case of the United States and in Canada, we market either on a carcass or a live weight basis. And that has implications on the next set of uh, slides I'm going to share with you. Example, the same study by Bruns and others in 2004 indicated that as carcass weight increased, we were always, we always uh, saw an increase in marbling, as you can tell here by this line that's represented by the squares, um, and rib fat, or the amount of fat on the, on the, on the back of the animal, increased initially at a slower rate, but as cattle began to get heavier, that rate actually increased exponentially to the point that it even uh, crossed over the amount of um, uh, intramuscular or marbling fat that we are seeing in carcasses. This is based on cereal slaughter, obviously. So the bottom line from this uh, chart is number one, that marbling score deposition is a linear function of carcass weight. And in addition, deposition of rib fat is actually a curvilinear function, more of an exponential fun function of hot carcass weight. So if we take the discussion that I generated on the previous slide and look at where we are today in the United States at, at the rate of 850 to 900 pounds of carcass, closer to the extreme right end of this uh, chart of 400 kilograms, we're looking at uh, a, an increase in marbling because we have cattle finishing in this category of marbling, as you can see on the left axis. On the right axis, we're also increasing the amount of fat on cattle that we're marketing. So that's, some, that's the scenario that's realistically occurring today in our environment where carcasses are heavier, they're more heavily marble, but they also have more trimmable fat on that. In the case of many of the folks in our audience from Brazil, Argentina, and other countries, perhaps in Latin America, where the end point is dictated by live weight, at which we might say anywhere between 350 kilograms of live weight all the way to perhaps 500 kilograms of light weight, then we're in the range of 240 to 300 kilograms of hot carcass weight, which translated to approximately 60% dressing percentage from the previous slide. But in, those, in that scenario, fat growth would be contained because the growth of rib fat is not as extensive as we see in the U.S. system, with values for rib fat at about one centimeter if we market cattle at about 300 kilograms of carcass weight, and also values of marbling close to 500, which happens to be marbling that in the U.S. system would represent U.S. choice. 500 points of marbling on that. So in a country like perhaps Argentina, we would be looking at cattle in this range, 
where it's relatively a uh, small accumulation of fat and a decent accumulation of marbling, which is actually my experience as I've traveled to that country. The question really becomes, as we consider backgrounding, we're going to, we're going to be moving this arrow to the right. So whether Argentina begins at 240 or 250 kilograms on hot carcass weight, and we move them from those values to 260 to 280 kilograms, we will certainly be moving, we'll be moving the value of rib fat and we will be increasing marbling. Now, as far as I remember, the Argentinian system does not uh, reward extensive marbling. They do want some basic values of marbling to ensure that that uh, meat is tender and, and juicy and flavorful. Uh, but this curve is the one that we would worry about in countries like Brazil and Argentina. So if we're moving this curve a little too fast, then we'll end up with carcasses that are, have ex extensive external fat, which in America we would be able to manage, but in countries like those countries, it's really looked uh, down upon, and we must stay away particularly from this growth rate to ensure that uh, places, uh, uh, producers in those places uh, retain a leaner carcass at the end of the backgrounding phase. Um, as we then look forward and translate this to an interactive Excel chart, I want to point what I just described uh, out here in, in, in a couple of clicks of this, of this uh, slide moving forward, recognizing that uh, in the United States, we want at least 500 points of marbling on the marbling scale, which brings us to a choice level. The question is, on this scale, what does that translate to in terms of live and hot carcass weight? So this is approximately 270 kilograms, uh, which at current prices, it brings about $1,100 of cash if we had raised that animal to that endpoint. So let's assume for one second, this is a non-backgrounded backgrounded steer, got on feed at 500 pounds of, of weight, or about 225 kilograms, and we finished them at about uh, 595 pounds of carcass, which translates to roughly 1,000 pounds of live weight, or 450 kilograms of live weight. This would be the very minimum the United States systems would need for us to have that carcass qualify in the scenario of choice. If we then consider what is going on today and we have moved to where this R arrow is represented here, it translates to approximately 880 pounds of carcass or 400 kilograms, which is approximately 620 kilograms of live weight. In that scenario, not changing the price, using a flat uh, bid on that price, we get about $1,600 gross return on that. If we take this same example and apply it to a simulated system, perhaps say in Argentina, where 350 kilograms of live animal at current price is represented in the US dollar, bring it back to $553 and then we decide to background instead and move that animal to 450 kilograms of final weight, the return translates from $550 to $657. There's a consideration that we must make when applying this scenario to a country like Argentina, and the reason has to do with this. Many of these countries, particularly Argentina, would have cattle genetics that are earlier in maturity than the United States. They're smaller in mature size, and they have a greater propensity to fatten at a younger age. For those of us traveling from the U.S. to some of those countries, it is very nice for us to see cattle that at 700 pounds or 330 kilograms all the way to 400 pounds, 400 kilograms, cattle are pretty much finished the way we would look at them in the United States. So 
So definitely for those countries, we're looking at uh, genetics that have a greater pro propensity to fatten at a younger age, but this fits their consumer system quite well because they have an appetite for smaller cu cuts of a high variety of cuts. Uh, excessive fat cover is really not acceptable and marbling is not a big element on the pricing structure in those countries. So I felt the need to represent this line perhaps by moving this axis to the right a little bit. So this is exactly as the previous slide you saw, but I've moved everything to the right about 50 kilograms on carcass. So now uh, the 200 kilograms of hot carcass represented by 350 kilograms live with the payback of 553 pounds has moved from this point to this point. Uh, and that gives us slightly more fat cover on that carcass. If we then apply that to the backgrounded animal, now we're reaching close to 1.25 centimeters of fat, which is be beginning to become not acceptable in some of those places. So we must keep in mind the potential for backgrounding and scenarios in which uh, weight is the end point that rib fat may be working against us, and we must take that into consideration as we move forward into the research. Just as a quick summary, in a U.S. system, increasing harvest weight is really highly motivated by marbling endpoints. So if we take the U.S. system here, this is the basic line weight we would need for those cattle to achieve 500 units of marbling. That translates to a third of, a, of an inch of fat in the metric system. That would be uh, 0.8 centimeters. We are, however, at this scenario where we're marketing cattle at nearly 600 kilograms or 400 pounds, or, I'm sorry, 400 kilograms of uh, carcass weight, at which point we're looking at nearly two centimeters of fat, which is definitely a lot from many other systems outside of the United States. And that translates for us to an increase in income, gross income of roughly $500. If we take, and you accept my correction on the system and we apply this to Argentina, the live weight doesn't change from the previously uh, simulated system from 350 kilograms to 450 kilograms, assuming again that this is a backgrounding animal. The pounds to sell or the kilograms to sell from a hot weight go from 200 kilograms to 275. But because of the differential in genetics between what we learned uh, on the graphs previously for United States genetics to the genetics in Argentina, perhaps, we're looking at a greater increase in fat that might be simulated from the graph itself. So there's a challenge that we must manage, which is we wish we could end up at eight tenths of a centimeter, but likely we're ending up at 1.2 centimeters if we choose to background cattle of that given genetics in a country like Argentina. So my conclusion on this slide is that increasing harvest weight under a weight endpoint system increases value at the expense of fatness. So we must be careful with that. Based on that discussion, here is a summary of the objectives of backgrounding in each of the systems. For the U.S., we're looking at heavier live and carcass weights that retain similar, similar marbling. So if I was working with a producer in the U.S., that person will want us to get cattle to be heavier on the carcass weight because they pay him by on the pound or kilogram, but he does not want us to reduce marbling. He may ask a question, what happens to finishing? What should happen to finishing performance? Well, we wanna make sure that the overall total costs don't go up and that carcass returns are totally unaffected. In other words, the premiums and discounts that that person may receive are not gonna change. In a non-US system, uh, backgrounding should result in heavier live and carcass weights this will help us amortize the cost of bringing in young cattle in and the initial cost of receiving and transitioning to their initial diets. And this should be achieved with longer days on feed 
uh, this amortization. But just like for the United States, we need to be careful that fat does not impact the overall end product and that carcass returns are not affected while at the same time perhaps contemplating an improvement in overall costs. So thinking back a little bit on what affects performance overall in the feedlot, if we take it into stages, pre-weaning, definitely the genetic potential for growth with, will dictate how those cattle will grow. Then health, the health environment of the calf pre-weaning, the nutrition of the mother, uh, pre-birth and even pre-weaning, and then any growth-promoting implants that may be used, such as would be the case in the United States. Post-weaning, and this is the focus of what we are going to be talking about, is what is the impact of the kilograms or, or the mass that we add during backgrounding? What is the impact of caloric intake? time on that caloric intake. So if we multiply calories by time, that will get, give us the total calories they're exposed to. And then a consideration to what if I do this with a digestible fiber versus a starch versus a sugar uh, substrate. And those are things that need to be kept in mind as we move forward. So as a quick review from what happens on genetics and health on performance, the data on these, um, these two graphs will demonstrate that lines that are selected for growth, such as the case of this A Angus line versus this K Angus line, will represent that birth, weaning, and yearling weights are enhanced by growth. And this is what I was referring to earlier in that many of our lines in the United States have been selected for growth. So we will carry into the genetics of our cattle going into our feedlots, cattle that are expected to be 370 kilograms at 18 months of age, 200 kilograms of weaning, and about 27 kilograms of birth. Respectively, if we chose the line that was not selected in the United States, those weights would be uh, definitely lower, statistically significantly lower. Uh, if we move to the health impacts on carcass uh, performance, the deviations here indicate the units in, 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 in this particular case is carcass weight kilograms below what healthy cattle would be, fat centimeters below what ca healthy cattle would be, and then the ribeye, so that centimeters squared under what healthy cattle would be. So we would be finishing cattle that would have been exposed to a health challenge with lower muscling, lower fat, and, and lower overall carcass weight. So definitely health uh, in the pre-weaning and even the post-weaning uh, phase has an impact on performance. And I will be summarizing this at the end before we move into the backgrounding impacts. Much has been discussed recently regarding prenatal uh, nutrition and growth, and then of course what we call imprinting or pre-weaning claims of nutrition and growth. So these two charts represent one the prenatal and, that, and the other one the pre-weaning impact of a high or a low plane of nutrition on birth uh, weight, uh, feedlot entry weight, weight uh, rate of gain, feed conversion uh, multiplied by 100 so it could uh, be demonstrated on this chart, hot carcass weight, ribeye, which is loin size area, and marbling. And this would be the low plane of nutrition on the mother nutrition and the high plane of nutrition on the mother nutrition. Respectively, this would be low plane of nutrition pre-weaning on the calf itself and high plane of nutrition pre-weaning on the calf itself. The stars demonstrate the statistical significance for each of the two charts, indicating that prenatally, if the cow is affected on their plane of nutrition, we would have lower birth, lower feedlot entry weight, lower rate of gain, and, and a smaller hot carcass to be sold out of cows that came from mothers that were fed poorly prenatally. On the other hand, if the 
nutritional challenge occurs uh, post-birth and pre-weaning, the impacts will be on weight at feedlot entry, represented here by 480 kilos versus 500 kilos. Uh, and the next other, only other impact being hot carcass weight from 368 kilos to 393 kilos. So definitively we have impacts of nutrition, both prenatally and pre-weaning on growth and performance of these cattle as they move through the finishing systems. One last consideration to talk about is particularly for the, the United States is the use of growth promoting implants uh, the two charts here are the result of work by Terry Mater back in 1994, in which he subjected uh, calves pre-weaning to no implant or an implant, or in the other experiment to no implant and a Cenovix C implant followed by a, sequ a sequence of three Cenovix S implants, as you can see on each of the two columns here. Of course, we must recognize that the main difference between these two columns is the presence or absence of an implant pre-weaning. Uh, mainly what we see in these charts is that the only values that were impacted were weaning weight as a result, obviously, of the implant on the calf pre-weaning, and you can see that on both charts. Um, but there was no carryover effect. In fact, there was some decrease in performance during the feedlot phase with growth of calves that were previously not implanted being greater than growth of calves that were implanted pre-weaning and also a heavier final weight. So as we move forward from the U.S. system, uh, the lack of implanting pre-weaning will actually enhance performance post-weaning, which is something we've already learned. And in many cases, we know in or sale barns, we like cattle perhaps better that are not implanted so we can uh, capitalize on the growth they contain within as we see from this information from 1994. So in summary, selection for growth, enhanced birth, weaning and yearling, and yearling weights has obviously increased some of these uh, 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 performance records. Disease challenges have lowered outweight, fat depth and muscling, and then improvements in prenatal or, or post or uh, pre-weaning, I meant to write, uh, plane of nutrition, enhanced feedlot entry and carcass weight. Interestingly, so far, we haven't really been talking about the impact of feed conversion, marbling or muscling because they have not been impacted as evidenced by the data that we've demonstrated. So as a big summary, we are able to impact the final or carcass weight with growth selection, health, prenatal nutrition, pre-weaning nutrition. This flat arrow here demonstrates that ribeye, marbling, and fat depth were really not affected by any of these interventions prior to cattle uh, reaching the finishing phase. So as a summary to where we've been so far, this uh, chart on the left would represent the U.S. system in which we're attempting to get more marketing weight to the marketplace, but we may risk a negativity response on marbling. Marbling is highly paid for at the moment in the United States, and I think the people that know something about this tell us that that will continue to be the, the case. In a non-U.S. system, we also want to enhance weight, but we must be careful with adding too much fat, particularly if we consider uh, background scenarios. So let's walk through a couple of uh, uh, research results from a meta-analysis comparison in which uh, in the first comparison we have calf feds, which are cattle that are weaned and directly placed in a, on a high energy diet versus those that were backgrounded or were uh, held out on grass and then finished. So the initial body weight has to be different 250 kilograms against 380 kilograms. We're looking obviously at two uh, different systems. This would be the backgrounding system. This would be the direct to the feedlot system. That would translate an obvious final body weight differences as you can see here, obvious differences in rate of gain, 
uh, very evident differences in intake, uh, differences in feed conversion to the advantage of cattle that were fed a place rather directly into the feedlot. A tendency for car carcass weight to be greater for cattle, cattle that were backgrounded. A ribeye area tendency, in other words, the uh, area of the loin eye being greater for a tendency on cattle that were backgrounded. So a little bit more muscling, a little bit more saleable weight. Uh, the fat cover actually tends to be a negative on the side of calves that were placed directly into the feedlot. Interestingly, in this meta-analysis, there was no difference in marbling at the end of this. So if I was a producer considering marketing more kilograms in the United States, backgrounding is an option in which I'm not affecting carcass quality and I am enhancing ribeye to some degree, so muscle gets enhanced, and, more de and, and obviously saleable weight, both as live weight or as carcass weight is increased, so my gross income should be increased. Uh, the rest of that story is, would I be able to do that in an economic manner? And for many systems in the upper Midwest, that is definitely an option. At some point early in the discussion, I talked about the possibility that energy substrate may have an impact on the response uh, to backgrounding. So this is, again, a meta-analysis results from Lancaster and recently in 2014. These are definitely two studies. I want to point that out to the audience. This is a study, uh, rather two meta-analyses, one in which they compa compared high starch inclusion to medium starch inclusion or high starch inclusion to low starch inclusion. And as you can see throughout this whole set of scenarios, the only difference that the meta-analysis was able to discover was that rate of gain for cattle that were background and on, on high starch uh, diets was actually greater than for those that were backgrounded on, on lower starch diets. There is no impact on final body weight or any of the other up, uh, 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 indices that were observed here. Feed conversion tended to be better. The reason it is on an X and the Y is the values P is 0.12. So if you permit me a little digression on statistics, there's a slightly better feed conversion for cattle that were backgrounded on a high starch versus those that were backgrounded on a low, low starch diet. So, so far for energy substrate, we're not seeing a real big impact unless we're comparing a high starch versus low starch backgrounding diet impact on uh, rate of gain during the finishing phase. So we're looking now at the results of our own meta-analyses. Uh, we're still working on some of the analyses for this, but I have some things to share with you here. I want to point out the treatments you will be exposed to on the next few slides will represent high grain diets. This would represent calves that were placed directly in the feedlot during ba the backgrounding or the, the period that their contemporaries would have been backgrounded, that intake total of megacalories of metabolizable energy would be 2200 megacalories. The same meta-analyses reviewed the impact of cattle that were placed directly on the feedlot on high grain diets that were, were fed at a restricted program. The total intake of metabolizable energy for the period of time those cattle were in the backgrounding phase was 1400 megacalories. As we proceed down the next two, we're looking at cattle that were placed on a dry lot or feed lot, fed diets based on forage ad libitum at about 1800 megacalories for the entire duration of their backgrounding phase. The next group is cattle that were fed a moderate energy diet ad libitum at about 1800 calories. So for those of you that are keeping track of this, these four treatments were dry lot treatments in which these two cattle were exposed to the same energy intake 
But the difference being, this is a forage-based diet, and this is a starch and maybe digestible NDF-based diet. These would be starch-based diets, one at 2,200 megacalories, one at 1,400 megacalories, given the time period that they were fed. And then we had the opportunity to analyze data from cattle that were grazing winter wheat pastures, which are high quality, obviously uh, forage supply, and then grass pastures, which could be typically a lower uh, quality forage supply. The endpoint for all the analyses you will see was equalized by antibody fat so that we can make comparisons at the same maturity and these comparisons would be more relevant. So once again, I'm gonna start with the end in mind, looking at the kilograms of final body weight as affected by previous nutrition. The next few slides will be set up the same way. All of the significant differences will be posted up here with a p-value less than 05 out of our meta-analyses. So we're looking for the most live final weight, and you will see the same for heart carcass weight. The most we will see is if we place cattle on wheat pastures or gra grass pastures be before placing them in the feedlot to finish. So those values are over 500 and 45 kilograms of live final weight. There's an intermediate group, which is the dry lot group of cattle that were fed a moderate diet, high forage diet at libidum, or they were fed this same diet, but on a restricted basis. And just like the previous meta analysis by Lancaster, cattle that were fed grain, high grain diets at libidum had the lowest final weight. They obviously matured much faster. We have moved that slide to the left on those first slides that we looked at. As I indicated before, hot carcass weight followed the same exact trends. I'll flip it back for one so you can see the shape of those graphs is exactly the same with an intermediate group for cattle in the dry lot that either restricted diets or ad libitum diets that were lower in calorie than those that were fed grain diets from the outset of ad libitum. And then the most carcass weight return came from cattle that were grazed on wheat or grass pastures. As we move forward, we'll be looking at other traits of significance from the carcass. And now we can consider ribeye area or loin area as a representation of muscling in that carcass, perhaps greater retail yield and again, cattle that were grazed on wheat pastures or grass pastures, or also cattle that were fed a high grain diet in a restricted format had the most muscling as opposed to those that were fed in a dry lot, moderate energy diets, or those uh, fed uh, forage at libidum. And then the smallest ribeye or the least amount of muscling was derived from cattle that were fed grain diets of libidum from the start uh, right after weaning. Fat depth will show similarities with cattle that were, uh, shall we say, heavier when they started their, their, their finishing program. Uh, cattle that were uh, exposed to wheat pastures, th those that were fed grain diets um, in a restricted manner had the most fat cover. Those that were grazed on grass pastures or fed grain Alivinum from the start had the lowest uh, fat cover. And you may think about this and say, well, what happened? Uh, other people have seen different results. And the answer to that is, remember, all these cattle are adjusted to the same level of maturity when they were finished. So it adjusted some of these values up and some of these values down as you think through that scenario. So for systems in which fat cover is not desirable, then perhaps uh, working on grazing cattle and grass pastures before putting them in the feedlot might make some sense. Looking at so far what we've seen under grazing, we'll get greater end weight and muscling and maybe more uh, fat cover from cattle that were grazing wheat pastures. 
High grain restricted tends to be more optimum for backgrounding diets in which we achieved intermediate weight and muscling, and they were not as, uh, they, they tended to be fatter, so that's a negative thing. In terms of the performance in the feedlot, looking at intake, cattle that were grazed had probably some of the highest intakes at wheat pasture and those that were fed forages. For those of you that keep track of these things, this creates a lot of volume in the rumen, so it allows for those cattle to eat more. Cattle that were fed grain actually ate the least, and some of the other groups were actually moderate. Uh, looking at rate of gain, uh, uh, the reason why hot carcass weight and light weight were better for cattle that were grazing or those that were fed uh, high grain diets in a restricted format is because their rates of gain were greater for cattle that grazed, intermediate, high for cattle that were fed a high grain diet on a restricted format, and lower for cattle that were fed in all the other dry lot uh, systems. This value here is a representation of gain to feed or feed conversion. It really is an average daily gain with a covariate adjustment to dry matter intake so the greater the number, the better the feed conversion. In this case, we see that cattle that graze either wheat pastures or, or, or grass pastures, and those that were fed high grain diets on a restricted format actually had better feed conversions than some of the other cattle in the groups of uh, in our meta-analyses. So the question is, do we have greater performance benefit if we manipulate growth uh, through backgrounding? In a grazing scenario, definitely we, great, we get greater average daily gain in response to greater intake and a greater feed conversion. In the group of dry lot cattle, the high grain restricted diet yielded uh, intermediate gains at lower intakes for, for better feed conversion than some of the other options. So after adjusting for degree of maturity at harvest, high energy diets during backgrounding will lead, lead to lower uh, end weights. This is cattle that were placed directly on a high grain diet. And they will also have smaller rib, ribeye area. And on a relative adjustment, they'll have a lower fat cover. Uh, moderate energy diets or restrictive fed, fed high grain diets will actually lead to intermediate end weights, live or carcass, intermediate ribeye area or muscling, graded fat cover for cattle that were fed restricted high grain diet. And moving on to grazing cattle that graze grass or wheat pastures, those cattle ended up with the heaviest end weights, live or carcass, the larger muscling uh, area, uh, greater fat cover if cattle were grazing wheat pastures or less fat cover if they were on grass pastures. And as far as finishing feed conversion, cattle that were grazing or cattle that were fed high grain diets and lividum achieved the greatest feed conversion. So in the finishing phase, these cattle would have the lowest cost of gain. So to conclude uh, the discussion today, uh, we will have the optimum approaches as perceived from our meta-analyses in the US system. If somebody was asking them, what should I do to improve hot carcass weight with relatively minimal impact on, impact on marbling, I would recommend a restrict, uh, uh, putting cattle on high grain diets soon after weaning on a restricted manner. If that same question was asked of me in a non-US system where we're trying to optimize final weight, then we would be looking at grazing grass pastures, perhaps followed by grazing a higher quality pasture out there. And uh, this is what I have to share with you. I'm sure there will be a number of questions. I'll be happy to uh, take those as appropriate. Marianne, thank you. Thank you, Alfredo. Um, I am going to mute you so that you can get a drink of water or anything that you might want to do while I take care of a few of our housekeeping duties at the end of the webinar. And then I will remind, and I'll remind anyone who is interested in asking questions to um, go ahead and either write them in the chat window or the question and answer windows. 
Um, I am going to now walk us through some of the introductions for next time. So I want to invite you all to join us next month when we're joined by Dr. Danny Fox. He is Professor Emeritus of the Department of Animal Science at Cornell University. In his long career at Cornell, Danny focused on the development of data, methods, models, and computer programs to accurately predict cattle nutrient requirements. His and his team's work became the foundation and seeds of the present Cornell Net Carbohydrate and Protein System Nutrition Model and the Beef NRC. He continues to work on advancing knowledge about cattle nutrition requirements. His talks, in August, we'll be on accounting for factors affecting the accuracy of predicting performance in growing beef cattle. Please join us, and we're going to take a little bit of a break in July and not have a webinar, um, a beef cattle webinar. So join us August 15th at 1 p.m., and that is Eastern Daylight Time. We want to... I want to thank you again for joining us. I especially want to help thank my co-host, Paula Torillo, who is sponsored by Rock River Labs and Bio4 in Argentina. I also want to thank AB Vista, our English language webinar sponsor. In our upcoming Beef Nutritionist webinars and dates are, again, August 15th at 1 p.m., Danny Fox from Cornell University. September 12th at 1 p.m. will be Dr. Jonas Sartori, PhD professor from Texas Tech University, and our October 10th, which will wind down our season of beef cattle webinars, we have a little bit of an abbreviated one for our first year, is Dr. Nicholas DiLorenzo, and he is uh, an assistant professor at University of Florida. He's going to speak about using forages effect efficiently to minimize environmental impact. Um, you will find eventually the archived webinars of this and past The Nutritionists, which primarily focus on dairy cattle um, webinars. And they can be watched online at agmodelsystems.com. Look for them under the webinars tab. There is often, and right now I have quite a backlog, a uh, delay of uh, posting as I edit out some of the awkwardness of the webinars, but none of the content. Um, webinars can also be downloaded for offline viewing or by clicking on the Vimeo logo in the video viewing window. We do a podcast conversion of the audio from the webinars, and they can be downloaded from the podcast under the Knowledge Base tab on our website. So I'll remind you to join us again in August. We are going to now open up the floor for questions. Um, if anybody has any questions, please be sure to write them in. I don't know if Paula has anything to start us off with. She quite often has a lot of questions. Um, at this point, I'm going to open up Alfredo. Um, Mike and Paula, do you have any questions? Right? Yes, Paula's got some questions ready. So go ahead, Paula. Okay, thanks, Alfredo. Thank you. Um, th thanks for the comments about Argentina. Okay, I have my first question is from Daniel. You showed us a study of major in published in 1994, which is the low and high plane of, of nutrition of the cows. Uh, Thank you, Paula, and uh, thank you for the comments on Argentina. I hope I was accurate uh, with your audience. Um, yes, that, that's an implant study. Uh, cattle were not subjected to difference, dif differences in plano nutrition, so they would have been exposed to the same uh, nutritional environment, both pre-weaning and post-weaning. The only treatments being implanting or not pre-weaning. Okay, great. Uh, may, may I go on, Marian? Yes, Paula. If you have um, a number of questions, go ahead. I am still, um, I don't have any questions yet in my window. I have maybe one or two. So, go ahead. Okay. Um, 
Another question, which would be your goal on ADG pre-winning? Very, very good question. Um, based on what we know, so let me, re, let me re, uh, frame that from the standpoint of what system we're, we're looking at. Um, Pre-weaning, and I'm going to answer first, the United States is a little simpler. Alfredo, the, gonna, the, I, the I'm going to interrupt you a second. Yes. Um, if you want to go back to any of your slides, I've given you control again. So if it's easier for you to answer questions, go ahead and find the slide that you want to um, refer to, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Yep. I uh, see it. I may bring it back to right about right here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, so the question to rephrase again is what would be the optimum rate of gain to shoot for and, so that we uh, achieve a greater heavy or a greater endpoint while not affecting some of the other things we're trying to preserve? And I think um, for a dry lot scenario, we would like to see um, the rates again to be in the range of about 1.2 to 1.4 kilograms. Particularly if we're talking about a system such as Argentina or Brazil, where we expect to not impact fat cover at the end. In many cases, for us in the upper Midwest, that's nearly impossible, and we end up with 1.5, 1.7 kilograms. But we can afford to do that in the United States. Anybody else should be should retain it at below 1.2. That answer the question. I think so. I think Paul. So Paula has to translate. Wow. Uh, yes. I, okay. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. I'm I'm translating, but um, the the question was about pre-winning. Uh, oh, oh pre-winning. Pre-winning. I'm yes. sorry. So before they are actually weaned. Yes. Okay. Well, that uh, that's a little diff more difficult to answer. I'm sorry, I uh, misunderstood. I thought it was pre-finishing phase um, and post-weaning. Um, so that's a, that's a really, really complex question because if we're looking at the United States where we have a segmented industry. In other words, I'm a cow-calf operator. I bring calves to weaning age and weaning weight. I want as high a rate of gain as I can afford within the conditions of my environment if I'm going to sell that animal at weaning. If I'm going to retain that animal and place that animal in my own feedlot, my own grass, my own backgrounding scenario, whatever, then I'm not as concerned with the rate of gain pre-weaning, and that rate should now be managed by what I'm going to do with that animal post-weaning. This may apply to many places in Argentina, for example, in Brazil, with the, where the entire production chain is owned by one operator or a group of operators. So in that scenario, perhaps a rate of gain of no more than one kilo should be the strategy so that we can retain the efficiency for post weaning. Okay, I'm going to give Paula. Great. Okay, you are you ready, Paula? Or you? Yes, you to I'm ready. Go ahead. Uh, another question: Can you make some comments about diets high in ether extract, like seven to eight percent, using ethanol byproducts on its effect on fat cover? Uh, yes, and and Paula, just to clarify, uh, I'm assuming now we're talking about the finishing phase. Uh, higher ether extract, 7%. Yeah, um, 
And there was one more element I nearly forgot. What is that one again? Uh, this uh, is in backgrounding cattle, not, not uh, finishing cattle. Oh, okay. So the diet is a backgrounding diet, high ether extract. Yes. Um, my recommendation there would be to restrict feed that diet. Otherwise, those cattle are going to finish too fast. Alfredo, I think the other aspect that you were remembering was that it was based off um, an ethanol um, co-product. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. And that is that would that would be applicable, uh, particularly in that scenario. Um, to to just overall discuss ethanol co-products fairly quick. That's not what we're here for, but I just want to make sure that the audience understands that many of the traditional ethanol co-products and now other countries, not so much in the U.S., are going to be high in fat. So if that's our energy source or main energy source, we will potentially end up with high fat content in the diet. If it is a finishing diet, I'm not as concerned. If the final diet comes back at 7%, I could feed that ad libitum. If it is a backgrounding diet, it will lead to uh, fat deposition fairly early on, particularly with genetics that are more early maturing. So I must consider restrict feeding that diet. Um, that's a difficult thing to program. I, you know, a person would have to be there to be able to generate that value. But perhaps if we were using an ad libitum intake of say nine kilograms or maybe even less this is a background in diet again so maybe six to seven kilograms for a for a contemporary animal fed ad libitum then we want to be at 90 percent of that value at the most okay thank you i'm giving you thank a follow up uh, break so she can keep translating i suspect she has many more questions coming into her than i do so i Paul, if you don't mind, I'll read your next question from Jorge. Will that help? Great, great, yes. Okay, and then you can keep working on your end. Yes. Okay. Um, the question from Jorge is, does grass grazing cover protein requirements, or do you supplement protein in those systems? Uh, that's a, the excellent question. So those gra grass grazing will cover uh, protein requirements. Um, Typically, we would consider adding protein to at least a minimum for rumen function. That number should be about 7%. Uh, uh, any greater than that it is, is good if we want to enhance that growth rate. But if we simply want to maintain cattle to have even um, a half a kilo of rate of gain per day for 100 days, there's nothing wrong with feeding somewhere in the range of 7 to 10% crude protein or making sure that that's what the forage has, the standing forage has. If it doesn't, then we must supplement to at least that 10, 11%. Okay, thank you. Um, a next question from Paula in Argentina is, could you offer your comments on a dry lot system in the beginning and then pasture backgrounding and dry lot again to finish the cattle. That's a complicated one. <laughs> that sounded, yeah. So, um, I, that, and it is, a, it is a tough one. I'm, I'm not as familiar with it. I'm going to give it a try. So, if at the very end, the main driver is still weight. So let's assume we're going to shoot for 500 kilograms. And if the uh, author of the question doesn't see that represented correctly, feel free to respond uh, or, or shoot back uh, another chat regard, you know, to correct that. But I'm going to have to assume we're going to finish these cattle at 450 to 500 kilograms on a dry lot preceded by pasture, preceded by another dry lot, if I understood that correctly. So... I would stage it very slowly. So to rephrase on that first question that was asked originally, I would probably mostly hold those cattle in the dry lot on the initial dry lot phase 
to barely gain uh, 800 grams. How am I going to do that? If I have very rich feed supply, I'm going to restrict feed it. If I have forage supply, I may feed it at libidum, but now I would be looking at 80 to 90% forage diet in the first dry lot phase for a grand total of no more than one megacal of net energy of gain, probably even below that uh, per kilogram of diet. And I understand uh, some of the systems I'm talking to do not use net energy again. So translating back, I'm looking at 2.2 to 2.5 megacals of metabolized energy for that first dry lot period, or, or in essence, uh, a fairly poor forage diet. Do I want to bring back that much protein? Really simply just enough so that I don't have a protein deficient animal, which I'm able to do somewhere in the range I said before from seven to 10%. That's the first dry lot. Uh, they move on to grass. I'm gonna have to consider that that grass is going to be of good quality, otherwise they would not be going to grass. So at that point, I wanna make some of my early gains as, as much as I can make on that and maybe use the last final phase to add just whiteness to the fat before I harvest those animals. So my intermediate phase being grass, I wanna be able to put lean growth on those animals, which will happen if I've managed my first phase on a very low, almost maintenance dry lot phase to begin with. So second, I'm gonna let them gain what they can. I cannot manage that grass as much as I wanted to, unless I'm gonna start dealing with overgrazing or some of those other concerns, which I'm more worried about than perhaps given a libidum grazing and, and, and letting some good growth on a lean basis begin. How long? Perhaps no more than 60 days. So there I'm gonna be looking at period of time rather than amount of growth a day. Will they do uh, 1.8 kilos? Likely they'll do 1.2 to 1.5 because they're compensating, but I must not really let them fatten in that point. And then really reserve the fattening phase to that final dry lot period in which uh, depending on my end point, if I'm looking at 450 to 500 kilograms, then I will feed him a high energy diet, perhaps initially on a restricted manner for depending on how long I'm going to keep him there. Likely, if I'm doing the math here, I'm going to be 60 days in grass. I'm going to be perhaps another 60 to 80 days in the original dry lot phase or the first dry lot phase. That gives me 140 days. I may be in the final dry lot phase another 80 days. So my first 40 to 60 days, my first 40 days might actually just be my finishing diet, but I'm gonna restrict feed it to 90% of a libidum, and then I'm gonna turn them on full, full steam to finish in about 80 to 100 days. Uh, at that point, I should have managed the fat cover and enhanced hot weight and retain efficiency in the very final phase, which is going to be the least efficient as we go across these three phases. Okay, thank you. I Great. have a question. Uh, Paula, do you have more questions coming in? I have a question I could ask. Yes, one more. Okay. Um, question six or another one after Jorge? Yes, yeah, question six. Yes. Okay. You go ahead and ask. Okay, this is from Jorge. In grazing backgrounding, do you supplement minerals, vitamins, or some, or use some additives? Uh, yes, I, I definitely would make sure that we don't forget the vitamins and minerals during uh, grazing backgrounding. Uh, as far as additives, um, the main uh, thing to do there is if I have moderate to good energy and I want to make more use out of that, uh, and it just depends what is available in the local area. Um, in the US, US uh, we would use Rumensin, uh, potentially Bovatec. 
Um, earlier today, I was talking about bambermyosins, uh, which is, I believe it sells as uh, Game Pro in the United States. That would also be an option for, for us up here. Um, if they're not available, I probably wouldn't worry about it too much, but for sure, provide a full complement of vitamins and minerals to ensure those cattle have what they, what they need to get uh, through that process. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question, and this is this is because I'm exposed to a lot of um, foodies, and there's always the talk of we need more pasture-raised pasture beef. Do you, what would your recommendations be, or, or is this just a sort of smaller niche market that isn't necessarily going to be that economically uh, important to look at would that make the not the U.S. system a little bit more like a non-U.S. system? Uh, yes, I guess if you're referring to um, the the demand or increasing demand, perhaps for more more uh, forage or grass-fed uh, cattle in our system. I think, uh, yes, if we were moving in that direction, uh, we would probably end up looking as uh, more to a, as a non-U.S. system than a, than a U.S. system. Interestingly, just looking at trends uh, and looking at premiums for choice cattle currently, that does not seem to be the case. In other words, we are finding enough demand for a high quality marble, obviously grain fed beef. What I think backgrounding permits us though, Marianne, is the opportunity to add more forage to the entire system and uh, and and, re and reduce our grain use in the final finishing phase. Um, some of the data we have looking at a simple 60 day backgrounding phase will reduce reliance on grains and concentrates by nearly 1,000 pounds per head or 450 kilograms, which if we're going to start labeling and talking about the history of our animals as they are harvested and presented to the public uh, on, a, on a tray, um, I think people value some of that information knowing that there was less of an impact from that standpoint. Or one could rephrase it and say, 70% of the calories on this steak were derived from non-human food alternatives, you know, such as. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna see if Paula has any more questions. Um, if she doesn't, I think we may, are you, do you have any more questions, Paula? Yes, Okay. I have one from Carlo. Can you make some comments about pre-weaning calf supplementation? Uh, comments on pre-weaning calf supplementation. Uh, that's a that's a really good question again, and and I'll re I'll uh, also go back to a systems perspective. If uh, if I'm going to own these animals post weaning, I'm the I'm the one that raised them. They got to weaning. I'm going to own them into the feedlot or a backgrounding phase. It particularly in countries where grain is expensive, it almost never pays to supplement in prior. It would pay if it would be some sort of a high NDF byproduct that could enhance gains prior. But there's only so much genetic potential for growth in these animals. If we consume it pre-weaning, we will lose it post-weaning. If we lose it post-weaning, a lot of the, the, the cost, particularly in other countries, not the U.S., for grains and, and grain coal products is high. So we're shifting the burden of growth to the most expensive phase. So we must be careful a little bit about that. So all told, if I sell at weaning, it really doesn't matter what happens to them afterwards. I hate to take that attitude, but simply financially, it doesn't matter to that cow calf operator. Um, so then optimum growth is important, investments in um, high fiber or even high grain restricted supplementation or creep feeding as it's called in the United States 
would be an option to ensure we're getting rates of gain that, that are what is expected of that genetic line. Example, if uh, the growth for a group of cattle in Argentina or Brazil for pre-weaning is expected based on reference values to be 1.5 kilograms, which is possible in the U.S., then for somebody that sells a weaning, getting us close to that rate of gain is okay. And then the person should consider the feed conversion of the supplement on that incremental rate of gain. Example, if they're gaining 1.2 kilograms without any supplement and we want to get to 1.5 kilograms, how many kilo, kilos did it take to get that 300 grams? That's very critical, and that's what makes us decide what is the choice between this supplement and that supplement. So in the U.S., based on what we know, we tend to use higher fiber creep or, or calf supplements that would permit us to get feed conversions that may be not so great in the 10 to 15 pounds uh, to one, so that that could translate to roughly a lower cost of gain. Alternatively, when we reach for a higher grain uh, supplement pre-weaning, we then must ensure that it, fed, it is fed in a restricted manner. That's a difficult thing to do because we use these creek gates in which cattle or the calves crawl under to be able to reach the supplement so that mother doesn't do that how we can achieve that in more extensive situations, that becomes a challenge. So the theory is there to be able to do that. The practice will be a little bit more challenging. Now, now let's take the group of producers that perhaps owns cattle post weaning for their own system. Likely in that scenario, I would probably do um, a, an evaluation of what is my cost to gain Post weaning, whether there's backgrounding or not, it's at that point unimportant. If that cost is pretty extensive, in other words, it's very high to put one kilo of gain post weaning, then I may want to continue to add that weight pre weaning and then turn them on to the, to the, to the finishing phase soon after they are weaned. Uh, so those are considerations that are not simple because the economics of the specific situation will dictate what option to do. Um, so I apologize. I can't be very, very specific on that because the, the, the specific situation, the economic situation, the production situation would dictate what that strategy is. But we must recognize that incremental um, feed conversion on calves pre-weaning on a creep feeder or a supplement is actually fairly low. In other words, um, that feed conversion, we need to be careful because it will, in many cases, the cost of the supplement will outdo the returns of that extra kilograms of gain. Great. Thank you. Uh, I have another question. Do you recommend ad libitum feeding or like 90, 95% of potential intake in finishing cattle? Uh, what about the, the feed bank? No refusals in the feed bank? Uh, yes. So that the question sort of refers to pretty much the same the, sort of the same sort of approach. So how do I achieve uh, greater efficiency in the feedlot? There, there is two ways. Um, and in the simplest form, based on what we described for backgrounding, uh, if we eliminated the war backgrounding for a second and we had calves coming from the ranch to the feedlot, the first, the first of uh, roughly 100 kilos, well, not even that much, about 50 kilos of gain, I would do them on a programmed feed intake or a restricted feed intake in which I'm going to make sure that bunk is clean 
because I'm going to feed him to 90, 95% of free choice. Once that period is over, we could consider that for one second backgrounding if we bring that term back in. Once that period is over, typically 80 days, 60 days, depending on the endpoint, uh, then we can turn them on to, to ad libitum with one caveat. And that is, I need to, bunk, to score my bunks every morning to make sure I'm not overfeeding those cattle, that there is no excess feed left in the bunk from the day before. This is way, sounds way simpler than it is in reality because so many factors impact that. So once I've decided to go free choice, I must manage my bunks so that there is never so much feed left from day to day. But we also must be careful for already wanting to do free choice. So many consultants uh, confuse free choice with a dry, slick bunk by about 6 p.m. the day before. That is not optimum feeding. That is restrict feeding, once again. So at, say we feed cattle at 8 in the morning, at 7 in the morning we do uh, a walk-through or a drive-through or bunks. There should be at least some uh, signs that cattle have been licking that bunk clean recently. So it must be it must be wet by lick marks by the cattle within that facility. Uh, one way to corroborate this, if somebody is restricting cattle, is if you drive through, if you show up in the morning and all of the animals get up and run to the bunk because they're thinking they're going to get fed and somebody is restricting them a little too much. So the day we show up, uh, to feed, to observe them, to whatever, that morning when we show up, those animals should be comfortable with us getting ready to feed them, com comfortable with us visiting the feedlot and not rushing to the bunk because they're expecting to be fed. If we proceed to look within the bunk and it is empty and cattle are laying down happy, minding their own business, then we are where we need to be. Okay, Alfredo, I think that both Paula and I have run out of any questions. Um, we agree that it was fantastic, and um, Paula said that they really enjoyed it in Argentina. Um, she probably, I'm going to unmute her so that she can thank you. Thank you. Paula, go ahead. Thank you very much, Alfredo. Your presentation was great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, we enjoyed um, we enjoyed it here, and how much you were able to bring in um, both the U.S. perspective and other country perspective, because we do have quite a few listeners that aren't necessarily North American based. Um, so that was terrific, uh, and I, I sometimes judge by what my drop off is during the questions, and I had very few people that that hurried off. So um, it was it was really good to have you speak with us. Thank you so much. Um, and we look forward to um, getting this recorded. I will let everybody know when it's ready. And um, thank you again, Alfredo. It was fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you for uh, Paula and, and, and you, your support on this. I very much appreciate it. Uh, it. You've made it very simple. Oh, good, good. Thanks. That's, that, that, is, that is the least we can do. You have no idea how hard we're paddling under the surface. So, uh, I, right. I have a I have a little bit of an idea, and it is a, it is a big job you guys are doing. So thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you everybody. Um, enjoy the rest of your day or afternoon, and any of you that are going to join us tonight, we'll see you back um, at six o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So once again, thank you, Alfredo, and everybody else. We will see you um, later, or thanks for joining us. Bye. Thank you and have a good day. Bye. Bye.